thinking about a condition like diabetes insipidus can be a little confusing uh, just because oftentimes when we think about diabetes, we think about diabetes mellitus. This is the typical type 1, type 2 diabetes that relates to issues with insulin and glucose control. Now, the important thing is to realize that diabetes insipidus has nothing to do with insulin signaling or with glucose. It has everything to do with antidiuretic hormone, ADH, or vasopressin. So in just keeping things simple, ADH is a hormone that is made in the hypothalamus, uh, released by the posterior pituitary, and it acts on the kidneys to promote water resorption. In essence, if someone has issues with uh, their blood volume, making it easier for water to be resorbed in the kidneys can increase the blood pressure and maintain perfusion to important organs. In the case of diabetes insipidus, there is an issue somewhere with the ADH signaling pathway. Now, there are two main types of diabetes insipidus that are characterized by their pathophysiology. In drawing our uh, extensive stick figure here, we can kind of appreciate that the kidneys are here, and then kind of the hypothalamus and pituitary are up here. Now, given that the ADH hormone is produced in the hypothalamus and released by the pituitary, if there is an issue somewhere up here, let's say head trauma leading to damage of these tissues, this will give us central diabetes insipidus. Alternatively, if there is an issue inside the kidneys with regards to responding to ADH, then this is termed nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. The end result is the same, where we have a lot of water loss through frequent urination, and the patient will present with increased thirst and increased behavior with drinking a lot of water. In thinking about how clinically we can tell the difference between the two, the important thing to appreciate is that with central diabetes insipidus, this is a production or release problem. So ADH levels in the patient will be low. Because nephrogenic diabetes insipidus is a response problem, the kidneys are not responding to the ADH that is present, the body will compensate by increasing ADH production. And typically in these patients, if you were to measure their ADH levels, they would be high. Given that this is the, the nature of the beast that we're dealing with here, it's important to appreciate that once you know what type of diabetes insipidus you are dealing with, that the treatments will vary. In the case of something that's central, the patient can be give, given something like uh, desmopressin, which is synthetic ADH, and that will correct the issue. In the instance of the nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, it is a little bit more complicated to treat the patient and a little counterintuitive. Essentially what is done is that diuretics are given to the patient, which promotes, of course, uh, salt or sodium loss by the kidneys, which at a glance might seem very unusual. However, the important thing to appreciate is that in the absence of using a diuretic, only water is lost. Now, the, the complication with only losing water is that this will not activate the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, but the addition of diuretics will, because losing both salt and water is what we need to activate this system. And again, initially it seems very unusual. Why are we also promoting salt loss? However, once this is activated, then in other areas of the nephron, salt and water 
retention will be increased, effectively helping to deal with a lot of the baseline issues that are caused by nephrogenic diabetes insipidus.